All right, welcome to History Money. Professor Barth here, History Professor at Arizona State University. We made it! Woo, woo, woo! The final lecture of the course, lecture number 39. The Bitcoin lecture, the past, present, and future of cryptocurrencies. We've been waiting a long time to get here. If you haven't already seen lecture 37, you're going to want to watch that on the post-gold dollar unanchored capitalism and the power of big finance and then earlier this morning i recorded a lecture called a short history of the euro it's 50 minutes long not terribly short but about as short as i can make it but right now we are going to dive deep into the history and and the the uh future perhaps of cryptocurrencies and we'll center this lecture on Bitcoin. But before we start with Bitcoin, let's just look at a general definition of cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies, and, and oftentimes you'll hear it called crypto. Crypto is a, a medium of exchange. Okay. Now, I, before I continue, remember the definition of money. Money is a commonly accepted medium of exchange. So just because a crypto is a medium of exchange doesn't necessarily mean it's money until it becomes commonly accepted enough to become money. But crypto is a medium of exchange that uses cryptography to secure transactions and to control the creation of new monetary units. And generally, and each cryptocurrency functions differently and operates on based on different rules, generally cryptocurrencies will store records of individual ownership of particular units in a, a publicly distributed ledger using blockchain te technology. If that sounds like gibberish to you, uh, I'll explain in a moment what that means exactly. But crypto comes from the Greek, Greek word cryptos, meaning hidden or secret. And cryptography is a technique whereby communication between two parties is secured from unwanted third party intervention. So you can communicate with another party without having to worry about a, a, another party jumping in and, and, and getting that information. And so encryption involves converting the information that, that is being exchanged from a readable state to nonsense, right? So the third party may intercept that message or that communication, but the message they receive is a bunch of jumble, mumble jumble that they can't make any sense of. So in, encryption denies that information to, to, to other actors. Cryptography ensures safety in, in transactions and, and in communications, and that's the foundation of cryptocurrencies, permitting people from exchanging money fairly without any any uh, uh, fraud or theft or intervention. Cryptocurrencies tend to be decentralized and there are exceptions here, okay? There are exceptions, but I'm speaking in the general. Tend to be decentralized, tend to protect anonymity. So, when you're using cryptocurrency, it's a lot like using cash. If, you know, when I go to a grocery store later today, I'll use cash. I like cash. I prefer cash. There's no record of me spending that cash at the grocery store. There's no record of it, of it at all. It's anonymous. Cryptocurrency functions in a similar manner. Cryptocurrencies are traded or exchanged peer to peer meaning there's no third party intermediary. When you pay with a debit card or a credit card, there is a third party in that transaction, the bank or the, the credit card company. Some cryptocurrencies, not all, some, including Bitcoin, are not managed by any central authority, but rather are dependent on an algorithm that has already been formulated and is already set in stone. So no central management. And, and for many of these, not all, for, but for many of these cryptocurrencies, again, creation of new units controlled by an algorithm. Obviously, the most 
uh, commonly used and and the the cryptocurrency with the greatest market capitalization is Bitcoin and that's not really a, any contest uh, Bitcoin well before I get to that let me, to give you an idea so as of December 2020 as of December 2020 the total market capitalization of all cryptocurrencies and and when i say all cryptocurrencies i'm talking lots and lots of cryptocurrencies we know bitcoin okay there are 7000 other cryptocurrencies in existence i mean there's 7000 so hundreds and hundreds and hundreds are in existence and if you were to combine the value of all the current market value of all of those cryptocurrencies together that total market capitalization right now in December on December 8th 2020 is 587 billion dollars 587 billion dollars of cryptocurrencies are currently in existence that's over half a trillion dollars now this is up quite a bit from a year ago when I gave this lecture to my history of money class the current market the market capitalization a year ago in December 2019 was just over 200 billion dollars so it's had a big year cryptos had a really big year and especially in the second half of 2020 really the last few months really really big time for crypto in 2017 three years ago when crypto was at another peak it was 330 billion so we're talking right now we're at we've never had this much value of cryptocurrencies in existence and the number one value to return back to the slide is bitcoin bitcoin is the largest it's the original cryptocurrency its current market capitalization is roughly 300 and it changes by the by the minute 350 billion dollars okay so all of the bitcoins out there in existence right now talking 350 billion dollars all of the cryptocurrencies together are 587 so Bitcoin hat is constitutes a clear majority here there are more than 18.6 million Bitcoins in existence right now so 18.6 million it will be capped at 21 million get to that in a moment there are 18.6 million right now but Bitcoin's had a big year. One year ago, in December 2019, the market capitalization of Bitcoin was at 135 billion. So within the last year, it's gone up from 135 billion to 350 billion. Here's a chart of Bitcoin in terms of U.S. dollars from 2016, and Bitcoin existed before that. We'll we'll get into all that. This was the really big, big. Uh, peak right here in 2017 we'll talk about the great crypto crash of 2018 later in this lecture went down a bit and and now we're up here all right around nineteen thousand dollars of Bitcoin so the question is will it stop you know will it keep continue to rise we'll get to that in a moment number two is ethereum and ethereum also uses blockchain and uh, produces a this blockchain computing platform that's what ethereum is uses a crypto uh, token called the ether and this ether can be transferred between different accounts ethereum went live in the summer of 2015 ether currently trades at 573 per token and it has the second largest market capitalization right now in december 2020 ethereum is uh, ethers are valued at 65 billion dollars so Bitcoin's 350 billion, Ethereum is second place at 65 billion, and there's about 113 million of these tokens in circulation. And here's a graph of Ethereum. And you see here, we'll see this uh, later in the lecture, but in late 2017, and all of, you, you will see these for all these graphs, late 2017, huge, huge uh, increases in price for all of the cryptocurrencies. And then a huge slide downward in January of 2018. But you know it's climbed up a bit, quite a bit. In uh, yeah, yeah, you look at it, I mean it's tripled in value since uh, since spring of two thousand of this year, two thousand twenty. Third place is Ripple, 
and Ripple is the uh, has the third largest market capitalization at twenty six and a half billion. Right? We're talking billions of dollars here. Right? This is big, big business here. Twenty six and a half billion dollars. Ripple is a bit different from Bitcoin and and Ethereum in that it trades at a very very low price. A Ripple currently sells at fifty eight cents. Okay, so you can buy Ripple for fifty eight cents. There's just way, way more of them. So right now there are 18, over 18 million Bitcoins in existence. There's 113 million Ethers. There are 45 billion Ripples in circulation. So you just have billions and billions of Ripples trading at right now 58 cents. At its peak in the, at the end of 2017, it was selling at $3. And it took a really huge hit. A lot of people lost a lot of money when Ripple took that took that fall early in 2018 we'll talk about volatility later in this lecture it is a a a risk in crypto markets volatility but with risk you also get higher returns all right like gold for example doesn't have the risk that crypto does gold is pretty reliable gold is always going to have value all right will ripple always have value <laughs> right who knows, right? There, there's risk involved. So if you, if, if it turns out in your favor, you can make really, really high returns. Whereas with gold, you can make handsome returns, but you're not going to make as large of a return because the risk is lower. And then fourth place is Litecoin. Litecoin for a while was second place. And people used to say that Bitcoin is the gold of crypto and Litecoin is the silver of crypto. Uh, Litecoin is now fourth place. Its market capitalization is at almost $3 billion. And a single Litecoin trades at $80. Though at its peak, it was around $300 late in 2017. But $80. And uh, currently, 66 million Litecoins are in circulation. I used to own a few Litecoins. I used to own some Bitcoins as well. Uh, I don't currently own any cryptocurrencies, so just putting that out there in case somebody's wondering if I'm I'm hyping anything. Uh, I I am not in crypto at all, although I've I've considered it going back in again. I got into crypto in 2013. I made some investments, made a little bit of money, but got out. I just couldn't. The volatility. I, I don't have the uh, the discipline to to deal with it. Some people do, and uh, uh, congratulations. I just can't deal with the stress of you know watching the, the charts every day um but anyway there's litecoin <laughs> uh i just thought i would bring up this one uh before we get to bitcoin there's another now this is not fifth place <laughs> uh, this particular cryptocurrency is number 27 doge coins <laughs> and uh doge coins began as a joke currency based off a a popular meme in December 2013, we've all seen this meme before. Memes oftentimes are very unexplainable. <laughs> Why did this become a meme? I don't know. It became a meme. Uh, but anyway, the, an online community decided to make a cryptocurrency based on this meme, called them Dogecoins, and, and began trading them at a very, very low price as a uh, and and use them as a a way to uh, um, message boards and online communities like reddit you know, someone made an interesting post or a, 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 a you know some noteworthy point you would tip them in dogecoins so you give them a couple doges or whatever and a, a dogecoin has always traded at a fraction of a penny okay so it's it's really it's harmless it's funny whatever well uh, in March of 2014, there was somebody in, believe it or not, somebody in Wisconsin sold their house, sold their house for $135,000 worth of Dogecoins. He was so confident that this currency would would rise a lot in value and because it's only trading a tiny fraction of a cent, even if it reaches a penny each, he would you would make tons and tons of money. He sold his house for 135 Dogecoins. But anyway, here's the, the, the chart of Dogecoins. And uh, right now they trade at one third of a penny. 
And even though their number, this currency, you're like, why is Professor Barthi even wasting his time on this? The current market capitalization of Dogecoins today, it's almost unbelievable, is $415 million. Okay, $415 million. The circulating supply is, because there's just so many of them, 127, 127 billion doges, as they're called. 127 billion doges. Doges. Take that times it by a third of a penny, you get you get the 450 million. Um, but anyway, so you've got that, and then you just have again, you have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these, and many of them are have a market cap in the millions of dollars. It's pretty incredible. But we're going to focus on Bitcoin for the remainder of the lecture. Okay, that's the 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 top dog. And and so let's take a look at it. Bitcoin, uh, the origins are a little mysterious. Okay, it was created by a, a an anonymous entity, either a person or a group of persons. We don't know who this person is. Satoshi Nakamoto, and uh, Satoshi Nakamoto created Bitcoin in two thousand eight as a, a an open source software. So it's very public about it. Um, you can access the, the the algorithm of Bitcoin. There's nothing secret about Bitcoin. It is 100% transparent. Okay, open source. That's what open source is. And uh, but Satoshi Nakamoto is a pseudonym, and there's all sorts of speculation about who it might be and and onward. But it doesn't really matter who Satoshi is because it was created, and and, and he just let it go. All right, and, and since 2009, it has operated without any management or administrator at all. I've been asked by some people, who runs Bitcoin, right? And, and the answer is nobody, right? That would be asking, that would be like asking a question, who runs gold <laughs> or, or who runs wheat? Nobody runs it. It just exists and some people own it. You could say, well, who owns the most Bitcoins? And you can have a discussion, but nobody runs it. Nobody manages it. It just exists. Now, there are the Bitcoin, BTC, is the main unit of account. But there are, but Bitcoin, one of the advantages of Bitcoin is that it is highly divisible and it can go down to as much as seven zeros plus one. Because a single Bitcoin now at nineteen thousand dollars, sheesh, uh, you know that's not really a usable currency. And some people, how could that possibly be a currency? A single Bitcoin is nineteen thousand dollars. It's divisible, highly, highly divisible. So you have a milli Bitcoin. There should be an I there. And a milli Bitcoin is point zero zero one Bitcoins. All right. Or you have a micro Bitcoin, which is sometimes referred to as a bit. Point zero 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 one, and then you can even divide it further from there. So you can still buy a cup of coffee, you could still buy a pack of gum with Bitcoin. It's just going to have a bunch of zeros. And eventually, if Bitcoin took off, frankly, nobody would even use this unit. Most people would operate with this, you know, with bits. Okay, if Bitcoin ever took off as a as a currency. Bitcoin uses blockchain, all right? Blockchain is, you hear a lot about blockchain. It's a pretty incredible technology. I don't understand it totally. I'm not a big tech guy, okay? I'm just putting that out there, right? Um, but blockchain basically is a, a way, uh, a, a ledger, a record that is out there in public and it's able, through blockchain technology, you're able to verify Bitcoin transactions. So let's say you have payer X wants to send 10 bitcoins to to pay e seven so you have x x or uh not seven z uh x and z i'm getting my uh, variables mixed up you got um uh, pair x and pay e z and 10 bitcoins will be traded among them that will be broadcast to the blockchain network the blockchain network will will validate the transaction. So you got to use a software, some sort of software application. All right, you have to use a software application. The blockchain will validate tra tra that transaction and then add it to the ledger. Okay, add it to the ledger. 
This makes, this prevents double spending. So, you know, you can't, you know, pay somebody 10 Bitcoins and then still claim to have the Bitcoins and try to spend it again. It, that, that's impossible because the only way you were able to transfer the Bitcoins to the other guy was through the blockchain. And so now it's gone. It's out of your control. It also makes counterfeiting impossible. You cannot counterfeit Bitcoin. It's not possible because the blockchain technology is there and that's what verifies verifies all transactions. There's no such thing as a false Bitcoin, which is a nice a nice feature. How do you spend Bitcoins? Well, the owner, the possessor of a Bitcoin, possesses what's called a private key. All right, and the private key is is the uh, the manner is is what is used to approve digitally the payments of Bitcoins to somebody else. All right, and then that private key. That's what is verified by the blockchain. All right. So if you lose now, if you lose your private key, you can't spend a Bitcoin, even if it legitimately belonged to you. But ownership of the of the of the coin is verified through this private key. The blockchain uses a private key to verify it. So this does mean you can you can lose your your bitcoins. Well, how do you how do you store the, this private key? The private key is stored, and and by the way, the private key is what is encrypted. Private key is encrypted. Your private key is stored in in a digital wallet. In this digital wallet, and there are all sorts of apps and and ways to do this. Actually, you can even store it on a what's called a paper wallet and have a paper record of what your digital key, what your uh, private key is. That gets into a, more, a little more complicated. But your private key is, is what allows you to spend the Bitcoins. Or when you receive the Bitcoins, you receive the private key and you store it in this digital wallet. And that digital wallet allows you to access the spend to receive Bitcoins. Okay. Now, if you lose your private key, again, it is lost not only to you, but to everybody. Okay. Once the private key is lost, that coin is unusable for good. In fact, actually in 2013, there was a, a user who claimed to have lost 7,500 Bitcoins. At the time, that was that was worth seven and a half million dollars. It's worth even more now. But he discarded his hard drive and it contained his private key and he lost it. So those Bitcoins are done. It's, it's, it's a, in a similar manner as, uh, you know, a Spanish galleon crossing the Atlantic and getting sunk and goes to the bottom of the ocean. Those silver coins are gone. No more. Uh, it, it, and this is what, what happens when the private key is lost. This is a weakness in Bitcoin, in my view. All right. But it's almost an unavoidable weakness because you have to have it has to be protected. And the only way it can be protected is with this, this private key. Well, how are Bitcoins created? They're created through, quote, mining. What's called mining. And miners offer their computing power to the, to the blockchain. So all of this verification of spending and receiving and such requires a ton of computing power. That's one criticism of Bitcoin as well. Uh, but this computing power, you know, you need to incentivize people to offer their computing power. And so mining is the way to do that. And you're rewarded by using your computing power to verify transactions in blockchain. You, the miner, are rewarded with Bitcoin. But to, you know, if you think, oh, I'm just going to use my laptop and <laughs> mine Bitcoin. Ah, no, 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 no. Not so fast. Uh, maybe in the early, early months you could have done that. Nowadays, you need immense computing power. So we're talking about really, really big systems here of mining Bitcoin. And this Bitcoin mining, it's not like gold or silver mining where you, if you recall from earlier lectures, oh, gold is discovered in California in 1848 and a bunch of people go out to California and there's this burst in gold or, you know, Potosi in 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 uh, Bolivia's the that silver mountain was discovered in 
1545 and all of a sudden all this all the silver or in japan in the 1540s it's not like that here all right and that to me by the way is another weakness i'll get to that in a moment but bitcoin creation it, it's mathematically fixed it's planned out okay now it can't be messed with satoshi nakamoto made the algorithm and it's set in stone so there are no authorities that can go in and and tweak with anything which is a benefit because you can't have arbitrary inflation of bitcoin but it is mathematically fixed in advance and back in 2008 by this algorithms and so bitcoin is a rules-based monetary system it's fixed it's it's based on a set of rules that cannot be altered by any authority and here's how it works so we're right now we're in this this uh this period uh until mid 2016 you had each block is every 10 minutes so every 10 minutes 25 bitcoins were mined every 10 minutes now every 10 minutes per block 12 and a half bitcoin are mined once we get to 2022 only six and a quarter bitcoin will be mined every 10 minutes and then it will continue to have every four years until 2140 when the final bitcoin is mined and the limit will be 21 million bitcoin so 21 million bitcoins is the absolute limit and that limit will be reached because of the halving in 2140 so as we approach 2140 and there are a lot of assumptions built into that mining bitcoin will become more and more difficult you're going to need more and more computing power to get anything because so few bitcoin will be mined per block this is the a chart of bitcoins over time and you'll see how it will just get you had a steep increase in the there's 2009 there's 2011 look at that steep increase so you just have a lot of bitcoins being created and then it's still steep but then it, it begins to flatten right flatten the curve we've heard a lot about that in 2020 well the bitcoin curve is flattening over time all right so Bitcoin has been used as a currency more and more. Some major websites like WordPress, Overstock.com, Expedia, PayPal have uh, accepted Bitcoin. You can find in occasional places. There's a place here in Tempe, a gas station that has a Bitcoin ATM. We can buy and sell Bitcoin. Rand Paul, when he ran for the Republican nomination for president in 2015, accepted Bitcoin. He was the first major candidate to accept Bitcoin. And then this in, a, in this last election, in 2020 during the primary uh andrew yang accepted donations in bitcoin like that hey i i like andrew yang i admire him disagree with him on some things but he uh, seems like a pretty good guy i like that he accepted bitcoin for his donations so you are seeing it more and more it's still more of an investment than a currency all right it just is it's more of an investment than a currency um, if you look at the history of Bitcoin, in early Bitcoin history, it was often it was used in some black market transactions. Um, Silk Road was the most famous of these. It was a uh, uh, a, a a torrent website, and users could use Bitcoin to purchase illegal items like drugs and and other things. This was shut down by the FBI in October two thousand thirteen. So Bitcoin's gotten a little bit of a bad rap because of black market transactions and illegal transactions so people are like, oh like bitcoin is associated it's not really fair to bitcoin because i mean cash is used for illegal transactions too right if you buy and sell things illegally you don't use your credit card okay you use cash so but that doesn't mean we get rid of cash it just means you know you got to do something about black markets and and in the same way bitcoin you can't really blame bitcoin for for uh some of these anonymous marketplaces 
Uh, anonymous currencies will sometimes lead to illegal activity, but you know that doesn't mean you get rid of anonymous currency. Also, another note, the anonymity of Bitcoin and the fact that it's not controlled by any central authority, much less a governmental authority, has caused China to completely ban uh, cryptocurrencies, and not just Bitcoin, but all cryptocurrencies. Uh, it's been illegal for people in China to, to deal in cryptocurrencies since 2009, since 2009. So, you know, Chinese government really doesn't like Bitcoin, and, uh, but most states don't like Bitcoin for reasons of you know, violating this historic link between state sovereignty and authority over money. Bitcoin is a non-state entity. It exists completely out of state control. And so authoritarian states really, really don't like it. But even democratic states don't feel very comfortable with cryptocurrencies. All right, let's take a look at the historic value of Bitcoin. I'll just do a real quick survey. Man, back in early 2010, if you were, if you got into this early, you made bank, man. Uh, Bitcoin traded at a penny of Bitcoin. That's like Dogecoin level. One penny of Bitcoin. By January 2011, it was up to a buck. One dollar. And then by that summer, it hit $31. Now, this is actually a period in which I first became acquainted with Bitcoin. Uh, it was back in 2011, I was really studying things like the, sub, the Federal Reserve and monetary history. And so, you know, no surprise, I, I ran into this stuff. And, and I remember looking into it and a little curious, but it still eluded me that I, I didn't quite understand it. So I didn't get, in it, get into it yet. But it reached $31 of Bitcoin in the summer of 2011. A lot of Bitcoin people got super, super excited. But then by the end of 2011, it had crash down to two dollars this was the first bitcoin bubble in 2011 so there the big peak and then the crash and when bitcoin was crashing in the second half of 2011 there were a lot of people saying oh bitcoin's done it failed it's going nowhere if only they knew if only they knew because while 2012 was a bit of a shaky year for Bitcoin, nonetheless, it climbed back uh, and not completely to its peak in summer 2011. But by the end of 2012, Bitcoin's selling at $13 a piece. Then it started going up more. This is when I got, I got in. In January of 2013, Bitcoin went up to, I think it was when I bought in, it was like 30 or 40. So is that about this level? This was January 2013, and I bought 30 Bitcoins, put some money into it. I was a graduate student at the time, so I didn't have a lot of money. But I put what I had into Bitcoin, and I bought 30 of these things. And uh, I bought them at $40, and when April hit, it was at $266 of Bitcoin. And I was just riding high, man. I mean, that's, that's a nice return within just a few months. Look at that. I mean, that was, it was just shooting up shooting up remember people got really really excited and and there's start you started hearing talk about bitcoin is just going to go off the charts it's going to be in the thousands of dollars a lot of hype about it okay and then another crash this was the second bitcoin bubble in 2013. bitcoin fell down now it didn't crash to the bottom went down to 130. now in the middle of this crash, I panicked and I sold all but three Bitcoins. I sold all but three. I hung on to three and I sold 27 of them. And man, I regret doing that. <laughs> but hey, what do you do? What can you do? I, again, I, my own, per, every personality is different. My personality, I just get too caught up in all the all the, the volatility. I don't hunt, handle volata volatility much. I'm more of a... I like gold, you know. I I want to I don't want to have to worry about the price on a weekly basis or whatever. Some people can handle it and just hang on to something even if it's rising and falling. If you invest in Bitcoin and I'll go back to this. If you invest in Bitcoin, you you've got to be hardened against the volatile day in day out movements, okay? You can't panic sell. Panic selling is a problem. And that goes for any investment really. Stocks also. Don't panic sell. 
I panic sold, but I mean, I still made money actually because I bought it at forty dollars. I sold at about I sold at about one hundred and thirty dollars because when it was crashing here, I mean, I a lot of people thought it was going to nothing. Like, oh, Bitcoin's done, right? In each of these bubbles, everybody has assumed Bitcoin's done, and it's never done. It always comes back. Can't stop the Bitcoin train. So it went, but it didn't, you know, didn't crash a bomb. It hung around here for a while. for that summer and then October 2013 it was $200 it's doing well and then in November 2013 it started going up again it went up pretty rapidly I mean look at that from $200 to 1120 and so that made this is where I'm like crap why did I sell because <laughs> back in May I'd sold them at 100 bucks 130 bucks as you look at that, that was the, the peak where it crashed, quote unquote, and then it just shot up again in the fall. It hit 1120 and that's when I sold my, I actually sold at the peak. I sold at, I sold my remaining three Bitcoins and I made 3000 bucks. Not bad, not bad. Uh, so I made some money. If I'd hung on to them, I would be doing, I'd have like a hundred thousand bucks right now, but hey, it's okay. But <laughs> hit 1120 and then you know down again so and then for a while after that so it went down by the beginning of 2014 it was down about 500 okay and then went up a little bit again around 700 and then through 2014 it hung around in a, a few hundred dollars a bitcoin okay so here's the numbers by December 2013, it had fallen to 650. March or February 2014, it was at 600, hung around there for a while. March 2015, it's at 250. November 2015, 400. I first taught my history of money class in the fall semester of 2015. I remember talking about it back then, and we were, Bitcoin still traded at about $400 each. Then to continue through 2016, you know, hanging around hanging around not doing a ton of movement and 2017 comes and the movement begins again in march it exceeded a thousand dollars again it was about 1200 then in june hit an all-time high 2900 dollars then in september it was at 3600 october six thousand dollars November eleven thousand dollars. So this was unprecedented in Bitcoin. In late in twenty seventeen, huge movement in Bitcoin and in all cryptocurrencies, all cryptocurrencies, huge movement. When I was teaching my history of money course in the fall semester of twenty seventeen, I was getting so many questions about Bitcoin because certain people in the class were paying really close attention to this, and when I gave the Bitcoin lecture. In early December 2017, we're at the peak of all of this. It was pretty fun. Uh, you know, in, in class, we had discussion. Do you think it's going to go continue going up or is it going to continue going down? By December 2017, Bitcoin was at $19,000. $19,000 of Bitcoin. And then, shoo, look at that. So this was the first bubble. Or no, that's not the first bubble. That was the second bubble. First bubble's not even on this on this chart. Okay, and then you got this. This is just wow, wow. It's like Mount Everest and this huge crash. This is called the uh, Great Crypto Crash of 2018. The Great Crypto Crash of 2018. It wasn't just Bitcoin, but all of these different cryptocurrencies. Huge sell-off huge sell-off in the early part of 2018 the price of bitcoin fell 65 percent by 65 percent in the month of january by september of 2018 cryptocurrencies had collapsed by 80 percent from their peak in december 2017 which made the great crypto crash of 2018 worse than even 
the dot-com bubble back in the late 90s, around 2000. So his 2018 was a just really, really bad year. I mean, think of how many people lost money who bought up here. Remember the, the lecture I gave, Tulip Mania and the South Sea bubble and all the different bubbles. Man, if you bought at $19,000 and then it just crashed, again, don't panic sell. Because think of how many people panic sold right here and now crypto, now Bitcoin is back at $19,000. If you had hung on to it and been patient, you would have been okay. Now, that, that doesn't always mean it recovers its full price. It doesn't. But in this case, it did. So you, you got to be you got to be wise about this, this sort of stuff. Don't just jump into this without being educated, without educating yourself on on the matter. You need a, you need if you invest in crypto, you need to know crypto. OK, don't just invest willy nilly into crypto. You need to know crypto if you want to get in this. OK, I'm just saying that for your safety, really. Gold is whatever. I mean, I like gold. I like silver. I think silver is very undervalued right now. I don't want to go off topic. Crypto's cool. I'm down with crypto, but you gotta, you've got to know what you're doing. Okay, so where are we now? Well, this was 2019. January 2019, we're at $3,600 Bitcoin. Now, keep in mind, that's still a lot of money, all right, compared to the other prices. Yeah, it seemed like a the great crypto crash of 2019. Nevertheless, I mean, give me a break. That's historically really, really nice price for Bitcoin. It just seemed low compared to the height in December 2017. But then 2019 is climbing up and up and up again. Uh, had a, a bit of a rough end to 2019. So this was 2019. And then the end, you know, a bit of a downward. But 2019 was a good year for Bitcoin, a good year of recovery, and then 2020, and here we are, okay? 2020, now, March of this year, remember, coronavirus, uh, Bitcoin took a little bit of a hit, but it didn't last long, and bounced back up, and by September, this fall, Bitcoin, and by August and September, Bitcoin was back over $10,000, and the story since then has been up, 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 up. Look at that. October is at 13,000. November, midway through November, we we're at 16. End of November, 18. And December 7th, this was yesterday. It's gone, I think it went down a couple hundred dollars since yesterday. It's at $19,000, essentially. So this is the move. This is a 2020 graph. That's not bad. Not bad for Bitcoin in 2020. Not, not bad yeah quite good okay if you bought here you've tripled tripled your value now remember it it's only when you say you know it, it only counts if you sell it at that price all right if you bought here and it's here and you say oh i've tripled my money no you haven't because you haven't sold yet you have to sell remember the principle with with stocks any any buying Buy low, sell high. Buy low, sell high. It's tricky business because you don't know what the lows are and you don't know what the highs are. Is this the high? Maybe not. Bitcoin may continue to rise. So here's here's the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin chart since 2014. Is this, are we going to see another crash? I don't know. I could see Bitcoin going up to 30, 40, 50K. There will be a correction. I mean, look at this graph. I mean, there's always going to be corrections. It's a free market. So there will be a correction. The question is where. This this may still have a long way to go. Nevertheless, I do see how steep this is. And this would give me some worry. It gives me some cause for worry if I were buying now. I would be hesitant about buying right now. Just give me my personal view. Some of you might not be, though. And, and, and so I'm not casting judgment on anybody who's buying right now because again I, I think it could go higher I, I could also see it going down quite substantially i don't think it's going to go too much lower than than this point though i mean it, bitcoin seems like a it's here i i'm not convinced that you know i think back in 2017 2018 the argument could still be made that bitcoin could possibly crash to the bottom 
and not have value anymore. And I, we may have moved beyond that. And so, you know, Bitcoin may be here to stay. So even if you were to buy here and it, and it were to crash down, I'm not sure that it would crash terribly, terribly low to a point where, you know, it's, it's nothing and it, and it doesn't climb back. But, you know, I'm not here to give any advice on what people do. Obviously, <laughs> it's uh, not what I do here. Um, one thing also that's in Bitcoin's favor, if you compare it to other cryptocurrencies, like this was the peak of Ethereum in late 2017. This is Ethereum now. Ethereum has not reached the peak in 2017. Same with Ripple. This was Ripple in late 2017. Ripple's right here. Hasn't, and it's number three among cryptocurrencies. It hasn't reached its peak anywhere close to it. Same with Litecoin. This was Litecoin at its peak in December 2017. And there it is now. Bitcoin has managed to, to climb up to where it was, which signals to me, and that's why I'm saying that I wouldn't be surprised if it goes up to 30, 40, 50, maybe even beyond that in the short term. Uh, because compared to other cryptocurrencies, you know, here, this was clearly, this looks like a bubble, all right? Every cryptocurrency is just going off the charts in late 2017. But you look at the other cryptocurrencies at the moment, yeah, they are up. They are up, but not astronomically. So that is a key difference. Um, and then one last thing about the value, future value of Bitcoin. I've seen, uh, I'm trying to recall exactly where I heard this, but I've seen numbers. If, if Bitcoin were to, if Bitcoin constituted only 1%, 1% of global currency transactions, right? 1%, which is a lot. That's a lot. Bitcoin's not even close to that right now. So it's a lot, but still 1% of global currency transaction, the, the estimated price of Bitcoin would be like a million dollars of Bitcoin. Okay. So <laughs> if Bitcoin ever does really, really take off and is actually being used worldwide as a currency, it's going to be a lot higher than nineteen thousand dollars. I'll tell you that right now. It's going to be really high, okay? But that's a big if. Will it ever get to that point? That's a big question mark. Big big question mark, okay? There's a lot to lot to consider here. Lot to consider here. Now, is Bitcoin a viable currency? Does is there a possibility of it becoming even just one percent of global currency transactions? You may recall early, early in the semester, we looked at, there was a lecture, I'll link to it above, titled, Why Gold and Silver? Why Gold and Silver? We looked at the different properties that, that allow for a, a commodity money to become a, a medium of exchange to become money. What are, what are properties that are money friendly in a commodity? And we looked at divisibility. Fusibility, you know, the ability to, to take smaller pieces and fuse them into larger pieces. Durability, portability, portability, homogeneity, impressibility, being able to put a stamp on it. Well distributed geographically. Intrinsic value has value outside of its use as currency. Well, let's apply the standard to Bitcoin. Is Bitcoin divisible? Heck yeah, it is. It's way more divisible than gold and silver. It's more divisible than paper money, it's actually. It's divisible by seven zeros. Is it feasible? Yeah, obviously. So those two things are good. Is it durable? If you don't lose the private key. It's a little shakier. But if you keep the private key, yeah, it's durable. A bit of a question mark there. Portability, is it portable? Yes, extremely portable. Is it homogenous? Yeah, there's no, you know, in homogenous meaning like when you have silver, silver and gold are homogenous because one piece of silver is, you know, is the same as any other piece of silver if you don't have alloy in it. Now, if you have uh, alloy in it, then, then you know, you have, it, it's different, but just raw, like silver ore is equal to raw silver ore mined anywhere else. And, and that's true with Bitcoin as well. They're all the same. Impressibility. Uh, that's what blockchain is, okay? Uh, blockchain essentially is the verification that this is a real legitimate money, which is the point of a stamp 
well distributed geographically? Yeah, it transcends geography. Here's the big question mark. Intrinsic value. Does Bitcoin have intrinsic value? And the answer at first seems an obvious no, of course it doesn't have intrinsic value. I've seen Bitcoin supporters argue that it does have intrinsic value, that the algorithm, that the program, the software has intrinsic value. The blockchain, the, the whole the whole software has intrinsic value. And if there's been elaborate defenses of that. I'm a bit on the fence on that. And I'm still unsure about Bitcoin just in general. I like things about Bitcoin. I'll explain what those are in a moment. I'm, I also don't like some things about Bitcoin and I'll get to those here as well. So that's a big question mark. Maybe in the comment section, you can give your opinion on whether or not you think Bitcoin meets these characteristics. All right, what are the benefits of Bitcoin? All right, some people have compared this to digital gold, right? It's, there's, it, it's a fixed amount. It cannot, Bitcoin cannot be arbitrarily messed with. You don't have a Federal Reserve Board. You don't have, you know, some money printing happy you know, socialist legislature that just, you know, wants to create currency out of thin air to pay off deficits. You don't have any of that, right? It's it's set in stone. It's fixed. It's hard. It's a hard currency in that sense. Some people compare it to a digital commodity, a digital commodity. And usually when you hear a digital commodity or digital gold, it's people who will argue, yes, Bitcoin does have intrinsic value. It operates on a rules based system. A rules-based system instead of an uh, instead of managed by an arbitrary board. It's impossible to counterfeit. It bypasses the banking system, right? It operates outside of the banking system. If you remember from the lecture I gave on the post gold dollar and the power of big finance and, and unanchored capitalism, I noted how our money system today, money in the past, when gold was money, money originated in the mine. During the Civil War, during the Revolutionary War, when paper money was printed by the government, not by a central bank, but by the, the authorized by the legislature, printed by the U.S. Treasury, it originated in government. Now, our money today originates in the banking system. Bitcoin is unique in that it does not originate in the banking system. Its origin is outside of the banking system. And that's a really, really nice thing about Bitcoin that I quite like. Another thing I like, really like about Bitcoin is that it is digital cash. It is the cash of the internet. It is completely anonymous and private. And I am concerned, I know many of you are as well, about the surveillance state and about tracking. And when I say a surveillance state, I don't just mean surveillance by government. I mean surveillance by corporations, by big tech entities. And Bitcoin is a solution to that. To be able to buy and to sell without any record, yes, it's going to lead to some illegal activity. However, that is a small price to pay for a huge benefit, and that is privacy and anonymity in, in transactions. And then the other thing I like about not just Bitcoin, but crypto in general is competition and currency. I think competition and currency has some benefits, also perhaps some, has some downsides, okay? But all in all, I think competition in currency is a positive. If a currency doesn't work well, it won't. People aren't going to want to use it. All right. And so you have a, a sort of survival of the fittest here. And right now, Bitcoin's at top and it's at the top for a reason. It is the superior cryptocurrency. Maybe some people might uh, have some issues with that point. We may have some uh, uh, defenders of other cryptocurrencies in the comment section and feel free to do that. I, I don't know much about other cryptocurrencies. So uh, what are the shortcomings of Bitcoin? All right, no intrinsic value. And, and you know we can put a question mark there. M maybe you could say it does. Nevertheless, that's a problem for Bitcoin compared to something like gold or silver. Not only does it not have intrinsic value, it's also not legal tender. Okay, so there are no legal tender laws affirming the value of Bitcoin, which harms it a bit as far as reputation goes among especially ordinary people. All right, nerds, you know, like yours truly and some of you 
viewers uh, are okay with that. Uh, but when you're talking about just ordinary people, all right, they like the security and legal tender. That's another potential shortcoming. It's unavoidable, but it is a shortcoming. Another shortcoming is fixed money supply. You say, how is that a, a shortcoming? Well, it depends on your on your outlook. If you're a Keynesian, then the fixed money supply is a problem because Keynesians believe monetary policy is a should be a tool that can be used to encourage full employment, to lower interest rates, to stimulate the economy, to prime the pump. And with Bitcoin, there's no way to do that. It is set in stone. There's no monetary authority that can do that. I'm not a Keynesian, so that's not my particular critique of it. However, I have another critique of the fixed money supply. If you look at gold and silver, gold and silver was not a fixed money supply. It was not. Um, gold and silver responded, gold and silver mines responded to supply and demand. Bitcoin doesn't respond to supply and demand. Supply and demand do not play any role in Bitcoin other than other than the price. It, it, supply and demand, let me rewind. Supply and demand does obviously uh, rule in, in determining the price of Bitcoin, the current value of Bitcoin. However, it doesn't influence the supply of Bitcoin because Bitcoin is a planned currency. So if you know basic economics, when the price rises of any commodity, what does what happens to the supply? The supply curve, the supply curve shifts in response to that. How can we apply that to money? If the price of gold or silver rises really high, the supply curve will shift and more miners will be willing to dig deeper into the earth to expend time, labor, and capital to mine silver and gold because there's a greater reward for doing so. They will respond to the increase in price by supplying more gold and silver. Gold and silver are not a fixed supply. Bitcoin is. Bitcoin has been planned out. It's a planned currency. So even though you can't tinker with it, it is fixed. It's not arbitrary. It's not subject to Keynesian uh, sh shenanigans, if you're not a Keynesian, and I'm not a Keynesian, so I'll call it shenanigans. Nevertheless, it's still not responsive to market forces. It's just not. And that's one of the things I don't like about it. And, and one of the things I think is superior in gold and silver. Bitcoin is also inherently deflationary. Bitcoin is inherently deflationary because if if use of Bitcoin expands, and that's the goal here, right, that it become a currency, it's more of an investment now. People are still buying and selling Bitcoin, it's true, okay? I'm not saying it's not used as a medium of exchange, but it's primarily an investment. Because And if Bitcoin continues to expand, if use of it expands, that means the price of Bitcoin is going to go up and up and up. If the value of money is rising, what do we call that? We call that deflation. And what happens in deflation that discourages, it disincentivizes people from spending that money. And so as the price of Bitcoin goes up and because it's a planned currency and because a rising price can't cause a supply curve to shift, you have a deflationary environment and holders of Bitcoin will be incentivized to save as much Bitcoin as they can instead of spend it, spending them. So if you have Bitcoin and the price is rising, rising, rising because it's being used suddenly as a currency worldwide, you're going to want to use any currency but Bitcoin because you want to hang on to that Bitcoin, banking on its value continuing to rise. That's a really big problem for Bitcoin. Now, there are some, there are some ways to circumvent Bitcoin. Um, uh, this planned uh, nature of it, you could potentially have fractional reserve banking with uh, Bitcoin as the reserve and to issue banknotes redeemable in Bitcoin. And, you know, you could do that whole thing that that's what was done with gold and silver. But this is something for me is this is what is causing me the most to to hesitate all right nevertheless i do see a lot of value in bitcoin and of all the digital currencies of all the cryptocurrencies bitcoin's my favorite and i like the philosophy of bitcoin satoshi nakamoto released this this statement 
upon, uh, upon the release of Bitcoin, he said this, the root problem with conventional currency is all the trust that's required to make it work. The central bank must be trusted not to debase the currency, but the history of fiat currencies is full of breaches of that trust. Banks must be trusted to hold our money and transfer it electronically, but they lend it out in waves of credit bubbles with barely a fraction in reserve. We have to trust them with our privacy, trust them not to identify thieves who drain our accounts, or tr trust them not to let, to let identity thieves drain our accounts. I like the philosophy of Bitcoin a lot. We'll see. The, the uh, jury is still out on crypto and, and Bitcoin. What I'm really, really concerned about, if you want to know the truth, I'm concerned about these guys getting into crypto. Facebook has already announced that they would like to get into crypto. They called it Libra. They announced this back in 2019. Uh, plans for it have derailed a bit in 2020. It was supposed to be released in 2020. A Facebook currency is going to be backed by all these different reserves. Uh, it fell apart as different governments, you know, threw up their arms and said, you know, we, we, we can't allow this unregulated currency to take over. Uh, this month, actually, they renamed the currency Diem, which means day in Latin. But I tell you, if Google gets into crypto, uh, watch out, okay? Because first of all, a Google cryptocurrency, if they were to announce, and I guarantee you, guarantee you they're, this is in the works. They're toying with the idea. There's no way they're not. If Google were to announce and to release a cryptocurrency, it, it would immediately, right out of the gates, be right near the top, okay? And it wouldn't be a rules-based system. It would be controlled by Google, okay? It wouldn't be open source. And, and you want to talk about privacy and, and tracking and all this, it would be a surveillance nightmare. And it would also be a signal that sovereignty is being transferred from state authorities to a giant tech corporation that has whose power more and more is, is, is rivaling, rivaling or even exceeding state power. Now with Bitcoin, you say, well, why don't you think of that about Bitcoin? Because Bitcoin's not controlled. Bitcoin's not managed. There is no Bitcoin authority. Bitcoin in that sense is like gold, okay? But a Google currency would be quite dangerous and that's an understatement, all right? So for now, this is the leading cryptocurrency. Where is it going in the future? Who knows? In 10 years, I'll watch this video and we'll see what I still think. But right now, this is the money in the United States of America. Where is the dollar going? Who knows? Who knows? But uh, anyway, that, that, that's it. That's the end of the course. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for watching. And whew, what, a, what a semester. It's been a pleasure. Extreme pleasure, actually. And, uh, and subscribe to this channel, right? If you haven't already, You'll enjoy the content coming out of it, and and I'll continue making videos. So thank you, thank you for uh, for watching, and and uh, until next time, peace.